season's over. We don't seem to see any more assignments for you. Of course, you understand you were only employed for the busy season anyhow, etc., etc. The effect on these people is one of disappointment and a feeling of being let down. Most of them are in the accounting field for life, and they retain no particular love for the firm that drops them so casually. I recently decided to let our seasonal personnel go with a little more tact and consideration, so I call each one in only after carefully thinking over his or her work during the winter, and I've said something like this. Mr. Smith, you've done a fine job, and he has. At that time, we sent you to Newark. You had a tough assignment. You were on the spot, but you came through with flying colors, and we want you to know the firm is proud of you. You've got the stuff. You're going a long way wherever you're working. This firm believes in you and is rooting for you. We don't want you to forget it. In fact, the people go away feeling a lot better about being fired. They don't feel let down. They know if we had work for them, we'd keep them on. And when we need them again, they come to us with a keen personal affection. At one session of our course, two class members discussed the negative effects of fault finding versus the positive effects of letting the other person save face. Fred Clark of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, told of an incident that occurred in his company. At one of our production meetings, a vice president was asking very pointed questions of one of our production supervisors regarding a production process. His tone of voice was aggressive and aimed at pointing out faulty performance on the part of the supervisor. Not wanting to be embarrassed in front of his peers, the supervisor was evasive in his responses. This caused the vice president to lose his temper, berate the supervisor, and accuse him of lying. Any working relationship that might have existed prior to this encounter was destroyed in a few brief moments. This supervisor, who was basically a good worker, was useless to our company from that time on. A few months later, he left our firm and went to work for a competitor, where I understand he's doing a fine job. Another class member, Anna Mazzone, related how a similar incident had occurred at her job, but what a difference in approach and results. Ms. Mazzone, a marketing specialist for a food packer, was given her first major assignment, the test marketing of a new product. She told the class, When the results of the test came in, I was devastated. I'd made a serious error in my planning, and the entire test had to be done all over again. And to make this worse, I had no time to discuss it with my boss, for the meeting in which I was to make my report on the project. When I was called on to give the report, I was shaking with fright. I had all I could do to keep from breaking down, but I resolved I would not cry and have all those men make remarks about women not being able to handle a management job because they're too emotional. I made my report briefly and stated that due to an error, I would repeat the study before the next meeting. I sat down, expecting my boss to blow up. Instead, he thanked me for my work and remarked that it was not unusual for a person to make an error on a new project and that he had confidence that the repeat survey would be accurate and meaningful to the company. He assured me in front of all my colleagues that he had faith in me and knew I had done my best and that my lack of experience, not my lack of ability, was the reason for the failure. I left that meeting with my head up in the air and with the determination that I would never let that boss of mine down again. Even if we are right and the other person is definitely wrong, we only destroy ego by causing someone to lose face. The legendary French aviation pioneer and author Antoine de Saint-Exupéry wrote, I have no right to say or do anything that diminishes a man in his own eyes. What matters is not what I think of him, but what he thinks of himself. Hurting a man in his dignity is a crime. A real leader will always follow principle five. Let the other person save face. Chapter six, how to spur people on to success. Pete Barlow was an old friend of mine. He had a dog and pony act and spent his life traveling with circuses and vaudeville shows. I love to watch Pete train new dogs for his act. I noticed that the moment a dog showed the slightest improvement, patted and praised him and gave him meat and made a great to-do about it. But that's nothing new. Animal trainers have been using that same technique for centuries. Why, I wonder, don't we use the same common sense when trying to change people that we use when trying to change dogs? Why don't we use meat instead of a whip? Why don't we use praise instead of condemnation? Let us praise even the slightest.
slightest improvement. That inspires the other person to keep on improving. In his book, I Ain't Much Baby, But I'm All I Got, the psychologist Jess Lair comments, Praise is like sunlight to the warm human spirit. We cannot flower and grow without it. And yet, while most of us are only too ready to apply to others the cold wind of criticism, we are somehow reluctant to give our fellow the warm sunshine of praise. I can look back at my own life and see where a few words of praise have sharply changed my entire future. Did you say the same thing about your life? History is replete with striking illustrations of the sheer witchery of praise. For example, many years ago, a boy of ten was working in a factory in Naples. He longed to be a singer, but his first teacher discouraged him. You can't sing, he said. You haven't any voice at all. It sounds like the wind in the shutters. But his mother, a poor peasant woman, put her arms about him, praised him, and told him she knew he could sing. She could already see an improvement, and she went barefoot in order to save money to pay for his music lessons. That peasant mother's praise and encouragement changed that boy's life. His name was Enrico Caruso, and he became the greatest and most famous opera singer of his age. In the early 19th century, a young man in London aspired to be a writer, but everything seemed to be against him. He had never been able to attend school more than four years. His father had been flung in jail because he couldn't pay his debts, and this young man often knew the pangs of hunger. Finally, he got a job pasting labels on bottles of blacking in a rat-infested warehouse, and he slept at night in a dismal attic room with two other boys who got his stripes from the slums of London. He had so little confidence in his ability to write that he sneaked out and mailed his first manuscript in the dead of night so nobody would laugh at him. Story after story was refused. Finally, the great day came and he was accepted.
then some of their other faults began to disappear. They began capitalizing on the praise we were giving them. They even began going out of their way to do things right. Neither of us could believe it. Of course, it didn't last forever, but the norm reached after things leveled off was so much better. It was no longer necessary to react the way we used to. The children were doing far more right things than wrong ones. All of this was the result of praising the slightest improvement in the children rather than condemning everything they did wrong. This works on the job, too. Keith Roper of Woodland Hills, California, applied this principle to a situation in his company. Some material came to him in his print shop, which was of exceptionally high quality. The printer who had done this job was a new employee who had been having difficulty adjusting to the job. His supervisor was upset about what he considered a negative attitude and was seriously thinking of terminating his services. When Mr. Roper was informed of this situation, he personally went over to the print shop and had a talk with the young man, told him how pleased he was with the work he just received, and pointed out it was the best work he had seen produced in that shop for some time. He pointed out exactly why it was superior and how important the young man's contribution was to the company. Do you think this affected that young printer's attitude toward the company? Within days, there was a complete turnabout. He told several of his co-workers about the conversation and how someone in the company really appreciated good work. And from that day on, he was a loyal and dedicated worker. What Mr. Roper did was not just flatter the young printer and say, you're good. He specifically pointed out how his work was superior. Because he had singled out a specific accomplishment, rather than just making general flattering remarks, his praise became much more meaningful to the person to whom it was given. Everybody likes to be praised, but when praise is specific, it comes across as sincere, not something the other person may be saying just to make one. Remember, we all crave appreciation and recognition and will do almost anything to get it, but nobody wants insincerity, nobody wants flattery. Let me repeat, the principles taught in this book will work only when they come from the heart. I'm not advocating a bag of tricks. I'm talking about a new way of life. Talk about changing people. If you and I will inspire the people with whom we come in contact to a realization of the hidden treasures they possess, we can do far more than change people. We can literally transform them. Exaggeration? Then listen to these sage words from William James, one of the most distinguished psychologists and philosophers America has ever produced. Compared with what we ought to be, we are only half awake. We are making use of only a small part of our physical and mental resources. Stating the thing broadly, the human individual thus lives far within his limits. He possesses powers of various sorts, which he habitually fails to use. Yes, you possess powers of various sorts, which you habitually fail to use. And one of these powers you are probably not using to the fullest extent is your magic ability to praise people and inspire them with a realization of their latent possibilities. Abilities wither under criticism. They blossom under encouragement. To become a more effective leader of people, apply principle six. Praise the slightest improvement and praise every improvement. Be hearty in your approbation and lavish in your praise. Chapter seven, give a dog a good name. What do you do when a person who's been a good worker begins to turn in shoddy work? You can fire him or her, but that really doesn't solve anything. You can berate the worker, but this usually causes resentment. Henry Hank, a service manager for a large truck dealership in Lowell, Indiana, and a mechanic whose work had become less than satisfactory. Instead of bawling him out or threatening him, Mr. Hankey called him into his office and had a heart-to-heart -heart talk with him. Bill, he said, you're a fine mechanic. You've been in this line of work for a good number of years. You've repaired many vehicles to the customer's satisfaction. In fact, we've had a number of compliments about the good work you've done. And of late, the time you take to complete each job has been increasing, and your work
work is not good enough to do your own, old standards.